One day, a god grew tired of the mundane life creating a new world to cure his boredom. The god named this eccentric world the Abyss, slowly sending his creations into that world. In that world, wars and battles were inevitable. His creations desperately fought for survival or else be met with extinction. Fighting, killing, and most importantly of all surviving to earn the god's rewards. The god enjoyed this, or rather there was nothing more entertaining to him than watching his creations desperately fight each other for his entertainment. In what looked like a battlefield layered with corpses of humans and dragons, a man was vomiting blood. What loomed over him was a massive dragon as he struggled to get up. The dragon's claw presses down on the man causing him to cough out blood. The man laughs hysterically and curses at the dragon telling them that the dragons were doomed regardless. As the dragon prepared to unleash a deadly attack, the man knew that it was the end for him and thought that if it was the other team they would succeed in their mission especially if it was that man with them. As Aura started to flow sending a signal, she receives that the last death squad has passed away. She tells them that there are only four of them left and are the last of humanity. Her name is Eris, one of the monarchs of Valkyries. Beside her was a man named Keldian who seemed to look like a sage. And next to him was Kang Tae who looked to be a skilled swordsman. They stared at one man sitting on top of the rubble, saying that they were the only ones who could save humanity. He was Kang Hansu who was a part of the final death squad. Opening his eyes, he glances at the time-space crystal, which has the mysterious power to return to the past. The last hope of humanity ended up getting annihilated 50 years after entering the abyss. In the group, Kang Te tells them that only one person could return to the past. He told them that it was already clear who was going to go. The strongest one, for example, asking they should know who that is. Keldian thought he was going to say something reasonable for once regretting that he expected something from him for even a second. Eris told them to keep their banter in moderation that most of the Valkyries were sent to battle the Golden Dragons and that it was a matter of time before dragons got there. Walking toward Kang Hansu, she tells them that the only one among them who could return to the past was him. He looks at his rough hands, telling himself that he had fought for way too long and all those years seemed as if he fought an eternity. He wondered if dying this way was fine. Eris gently put her hand on top of his, telling him that the hope of humanity was in his hand and that he not give up. Looking up, he sees his remaining comrades. Keldian tells him that Eris is right and that the fact that he started 20 years later than them, yet still stood in this position was proof. Eris tells him that if he had started earlier, the present outcome would have been different. Even Kang Te told him that he acknowledged his skill, but if he didn't want to go, he could speak up any time. Kang Te wondered if he could go back, he could get all the items that he couldn't get before. Looking at Eris' expression, Kang Te switched back to Kang Hansu, getting all the items since only he could go back. Tired but not giving up hope, Kang stood up. His comrades watched as he got closer to the time-space crystal. As it began to glow, they felt the place shook. The roof started to crack, and looking up there was a huge dragon. The dragon was preparing for its attack. Keldian told him not to get distracted and that they would stop it. As the attack was about to reach them, Keldian set up a magic circle. As Keldian blocked the attack, he told Kang Te and Eris to switch positions and to make sure to hold off the dragon for a while as he got ready. Kang Te blocks a piece of fallen rubble and tells Keldian and Kang Hansu to leave it to them. Eris rushes in and tells Kang Te to follow her lead. She spun her weapon slamming it into the ground and activating her skill still while signaling to Kang Te. He tells her that she doesn't have to remind him. As his aura circulates around him, he yells while swinging his sword having it sliced through the rubble and dragons. As he was thinking that he had gotten most of them, he barely blocked the dragon's claws coming toward him. As Kang Hansu wanted to help out, Keldian told him to focus on the mission. Keldian tells him that his main weapon is broken already and to stop thinking about this place. Ares agrees, telling Keldian is right. She tells him to leave it to them 
and once he returns to the past to help others, even if he finds them annoying. She asked him if he would listen to her this one time. He tells her that he will try. Air tells him even in the circumstances that he is still the same. She tells Keldian that she has to leave the rest to him. Keldian tells Kang Han Su to listen carefully. As Keldian is activating a spell, he tells him just as Iris had said to not kill needlessly and also not to show any mercy to those who bring humanity harm during the Great War. He tells him to save only those who deserve it and also the berserk monarch Clementine to make sure to at least kill that bastard. Keldian asked if he had understood and Hang Hansu nodded. As Keldian activated the spell, the time-space crystal started to spin. His comrades look back to see this event unfold. As Keldian finishes, a beam of light comes out of the building layering it with dozens of magic spells. As the energy starts to flow out of the time-space crystal, it sends Kang Hansu to the past. Looking around at the environment and people, he knew it had worked and that he wouldn't fail in this life. Everyone around seems to be in a panic asking to go back. It was pure chaos as everyone was trying to find an answer to why they were there. Kang Han Su acknowledged they were flustered as they had just appeared in the other world. The year he was born was special. At first it was only 100 people, but the number increased exponentially. So much so that it went out of control with so many missing people. When he turned 20, he went missing due to an unknown power. The other world is a place where it devours other dimensions and is the midpoint of the abyss's impact. Those who arrived first learned skills first and were overly active, but the strange looking monster made it a horrific place. Those that are swallowed by the abyss are transported to the other world. Once everyone arrives, the door to the abyss will open and the great war will start. Kang Han Su knows he only has five years to become strong and that all his old skills and strength are gone. As Kang Han Su was expecting that something was about to happen, a crack in the sky caused people to panic saying the sky was falling. Popping outside the crack was a little creature with wings and horns like a devil. The creature saw the people were looking at him. It greeted them saying he was the assistant fairy who would help with the proceeding. The fairy asked if they could listen to what he was about to say. Kang Han Su thinks to himself that the fairies are fake bastards and the quick proceeding that it's talking about involves everyone fighting and beating each other up. The fairy greets them welcoming them to the other world. As the fairy was about to speak it was interrupted. A man yelling tells him to stop the bullshit and to send him home. The fairy was ticked off from being interrupted and continued his explanation. The man is startled by the change in the fairy's tone. The fairy tells them that in this place they are free from all the laws and rules and not just that. They could become stronger just like the heroes they see from the movies. The fairy relish in the fact that they could make everything they imagined come true. Using the man who yelled at him before as a demonstration, the man suddenly had a massive hole in his body. The people stared at the man who had his body torn in fright. Seeing him dead on the ground, they started to panic. The fairy tells them that he is sorry and doesn't like loud sounds. The people start to run for their lives while screaming. The fairy snapping his hands, sends a hole through their body killing them. This time the fairy yells making sure they know that he hated loud noise and making them shut up. The fairy asks the ones who are still alive if they'll work hard making them realize the situation they're in. The fairy was glad that it was nice and quiet and continued his speech. Taking a white stone out of a body, the fairy explains that it is called a rune and can be obtained by killing anything alive. The fairy says that there are eight other different colors that can increase their strength. The fairy asks if there is anyone who wants to take the one he had in his hand. Kang Han Su walks up raising his hand. He felt that it had been a while since he used one the fairy liked his enthusiasm and gave him the rune, telling him that his strength had gone up. The fairy was not expecting Kang Hansu to have such an aloof expression. The fairy explains to them that runes have different effects depending on what type they are. The fairy said that it wanted to show one more thing, scaring the people, 
and it changed its mind unwilling to lose more players. It tells them to take note that no matter what rune or ability it increases it won't be a bad thing, and to collect a lot of rune that is, if they want to survive. The crowd seeing the rune on the ground starts to push and shove trying to pick up the rune. As someone was about to take the rune from the ground, the fairy using its power pulled it toward him saying he'll be taking this rune back making people fill with despair. It tells them that if they touch their right ear they could see their stats since humans like to quantify things. Kang Han Su checks his stats. Seeing that his strength has gone up by one, after hunting, his other hidden stats such as mana and magic power would increase too. In this world, you can acquire runes anywhere as long as you kill a living thing, and it doesn't matter what you hunt. As the fairy is about to leave it, tells them to forget about the past and enjoy their new lives. And once he leaves the tutorial begins telling them to do their best. The people hearing screaming look behind. Seeing that a group of goblins come out of nowhere, the goblins started to march toward them. Seeing the massive group of goblins behind them, the goblins seemed to be ready to attack. The crowds were scared to see such a creature and to fight for the first time in their lives. A lady raises her hand asking everyone to calm down, to not aggravate them while moving backward. Kang Hansu stood still while watching everyone else back up. Bumping in someone, he asked him what he was doing. The man told him that something was off and that it was blocked off. The man started to knock on the barrier asking to be let out. The barrier seemed to move closer toward them. The man realized that the walls were closing in and that the goblin started to get closer. Seeing the goblin climb over each other to get to them. A man curses saying that he could not die like this. Looking behind him sees a man pass through the barrier asking him how he got there. The man tells him he didn't know how and just passed through. A guy saw that there was a number 49 on the barrier. Seeing another man run through, the number decreased. They figured that only 50 people could leave. They all push and shove to get to the door. Looking back Kang Hansu thought it was pathetic. If they had worked together they would have sustained some injuries in the process, but there would be fewer casualties. When he first did this roughly 40 people had died to the goblin and of those that could not pass the barrier only 10 survived. He swore that this time would be a different story. Seeing the goblin start to rush in, a goblin jumped at a man ready to end him, asking someone to save him right as the knife was about to cut him. He saw that the goblin had split apart. Kang Hansu started to go toe to toe against the goblin slicing and ending the goblin's life one by one ready to face whatever heads his way. The people watching were stunned, sweating, and a bit tired. Kang Hansu left a bit uncomfortable as he had to get used to his body from tens of years ago, but with all that he was pretty lucky, increasing his dexterity. The dexterity does not only help with speed but also with reaction time, meaning that the user can do the same action that much faster. As a goblin threw his dagger toward him, he was able to react to it quicker, smoothly dodging the blade. Using his own blade, he threw it at the goblin implanting it into its head. The goblin seeing this rushed to Kang Hansu, mad that one of their kind has died, as he expected the goblin would get riled up as soon as they see blood. Using his speed he quickly dispatches three goblins. Cutting a goblin he catches the runes and absorbs it, getting ready for more. The people watching were shocked to see him fight goblins alone. Gaining their courage they rush toward the horde of goblins. There the humans and goblins struggle for survival. Slicing another one Kang Hansu thinks that there is usually no need to rush like this, but there is no time to dawdle around right now. Outside including this place, there were many other travelers. If you count the whole world that would be an immeasurable amount. The first years that come would be protected in the tutorial area for three months, then they are thrown into a fight with the second and third years having to fend for themselves. Whatever you may think, this is a chance. A chance to get stronger, even if it was just a little. He thought to himself while absorbing a rune, that it was the right choice to send him to this period, thanking Keldian. As there was a bunch of corpses on the ground, the people thought that it was unbelievable wondering if he really fought that many of the goblins on his own. 
where he stood corpse piled up beside him. They thought that he was a monster.